who are open this morning. Second Timothy chapter 2. Now, from Second Timothy chapter 2, I'll be able to know them so. Okay. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, it reads, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy towards us. Lord, it's only because of Calvary that we can avail of the grace in the way that we do in this day and time. And Lord, as we uh, approach the time of the year where we remember the death, burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, Father, I just do pray that you would help us to get a, a, a deeper appreciation, a deeper grasp of your grace that has resulted from the Lord Jesus coming. And uh, Father, I just do pray that the Holy Spirit of God would lead and guide through your word at this time. Lord, I just pray that we would have uh, a still mind, uh, a mind that's uh, more open to the Holy Spirit of God working individually in our minds and hearts as we need. And uh, Father, I just uh, thank you for that. Lord, I do commit this time into your hands and do ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. You know, like I said, uh, just, you know, as I was just praying, the, the reality is uh, we wouldn't have the grace of God in the form that we have uh, today if it weren't for the Lord Jesus Christ coming to the cross, coming sorry, to this earth and then going to the cross at the culmination of his life. Uh, and what does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's grace. That's an undeserved favour. When the Lord Jesus Christ came and, and was allowed himself to, obviously, you know, grew up in, in his earthly body, sinless earthly body, and became the Lamb of God, uh, you know, you stop and you think about when they, when, when, a, when a, a lamb is, is, uh, is, is butchered for for meat consumption, they drain the blood. But you know, with uh, the Lord Jesus Christ being the Lamb of God, the one and only final sacrifice for our sins, uh, He had to shed every bit of His blood to make that perfect sacrifice for your sins and for mine. Hence the, the Roman scourge, which literally tore His flesh to shreds. Uh, and as it tells us in Isaiah at that time, His visage was so marred more than any man. And that was to enable that to happen. So that he could fully shed the blood uh, that he had in his body to make that one perfect payment for your sins and for mine. And, and thereby, uh, the Lord you know, went to the cross, paid for our sins. Uh, he was buried, he rose again, he ascended up to heaven. And that ushered in the age of grace. The age that we are still in at this time. And uh, only just, but... You know, the Lord knows the day and the hour when, when this age will, will be completed and moves on to the next period of time recorded in the Word of God. But uh, I, I want to think this morning about what Paul has written here uh, about the grace of God. And he said, there, thou, thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ had to come and do what he did so that we could by by grace by the grace of god uh, if we we see our sin itself as a, as a lost sinner guilty before the holy sinless god of heaven and earth we can simply trust him by faith alone to be saved from our sins and from a literal hell uh, forever and so paul here is writing in his second epistle to timothy who by this time had served the lord for approximately 17 years and for most of Paul's second and third missionary journeys, he'd been one of Paul's companions in the work of God. Now, uh, go over to Acts chapter 16, with, and uh, keep your place there in 2 uh, Timothy. Undoubtedly, through the course of the, the sermon, we'll, we'll go back there. But in Acts chapter 16, have a look at verse 1 and 2. 
Uh, we see here Paul, he's just set off on his second missionary journey. And it says, Then came he to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there, named Timotheus, uh, in other words, Timothy, uh, the son of a certain woman, uh, which was a Jewess, and believed, but his father was a Greek, uh, which was well reported on by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him, talk with Timothy. And so this is where Timothy started to, to, uh, to journey with Paul and, and his other travelling companions like Luke, the, the, uh, the doctor, the physician, that uh, was faithful in the work. And this was around 49, 50 AD, thereabouts, when Paul uh, started that journey. And so Timothy was there. Uh, Timothy was there in, in Ephesus when revival broke out years later, uh, when Paul had that great ministry there and the Word of God went out into all Asia. And so by the time Paul wrote here to Timothy in 2 Timothy, uh, Paul is he's, he's basically reached uh, the end of his life. He's about to be martyred and lose his life uh, for the sake of the gospel, for what he'd been doing. And um, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, uh, it, uh, it tells us that uh, well, Paul calls Timothy his own son in the faith. Now, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, Two, it says, Under Timothy, my own son in the faith. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we can we can see from that that, that the, through the ministry of Paul, uh, Timothy came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lord and Saviour. And so uh, Paul had preached in the places that, that we read off there in, uh, in Acts chapter 16 <coughs> in Lystra and Derby. Paul preached there on his first missionary journey. In fact, uh, Lystra, as, as I'll say occasionally, uh, Lystra was the place that Paul was stoned to death on his first missionary journey. You know, welcome to the ministry, Paul. Uh, here, pop this. And, uh, and so God wasn't finished with him. They, they, they threw his body out, at the, out on the uh, city limits as though he was dead. And uh, look, you know, they, weren't, they weren't silly. They weren't going to go, oh, no, he's only... Oh, yeah, he looks dead and he's still moving around. No, of course he was. You know, they, they'd done the job. But God wasn't finished with him. In fact, he was only just started with Paul at that time, early in his uh, first missionary journey. And so Paul was stoned to death. God raised him up in Lystra, uh, the place. Uh, it's not clear whether it was Lystra or Derby that, that um, Timothy was from, but obviously they were close together. They, are close, they were close together. And, um, and Timothy was well known in that area. And so Paul preached in those places. Uh, it's quite possible that Timothy actually saw Paul get stoned to death. Perhaps that was the, the catalyst for him coming to know Christ as his saviour when Paul gets up from the outside the city limits and comes back into the city. We don't know that, but it's a possibility. But that's the place that he was from, uh, young Timothy. <coughs> Excuse me. So here in 2 Timothy, years later, uh, approximately 66, 67 AD, just before Paul's about to be martyred, uh, Paul is exhorting uh, young Timothy uh, in what he's writing here. Have a look over in chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. 2 Timothy 4, verse 6 and 7. Paul wrote there, he said, For I am now ready to be offered, <coughs> excuse me, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. So what's the scenario, scenario here? If you have your Bibles in front of you and you've got the little attribution uh, there at the end of chapter 4, it says, uh, in mine it says, the second epistle unto Timoth Timotheus, understanding that the little attribution at the end is it's not scripture, it's just giving you a, uh, a, a, an insight into where it was written and, and, and how and so forth. Uh, the second epistle unto Timotheus ordained the first bishop of the church at, of, F, of, the F, sorry, of the Ephesians, I'll get it out, was written from Rome when Paul was brought before Nero the second time. And so if, if, you, if you're a bit of a history buff, you know that Nero uh, was blamed for the big fires of Rome, uh, as though he'd set it, set it alight. And he had, he had to uh, put the blame on somebody, so he blamed the Christians. And so this is a time where Paul was brought before Nero the second time, and, uh, and it resulted, as we see there in verse six and seven, Paul knew that this was, this was going to be the time. Um, I won't go into what's further over, but nonetheless, Paul said there in verse 7, he said, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Uh, I'm now ready. 
verse six. And so in this in this epistle, you need to you need to paint the picture in your own mind of Paul. Paul is writing to Timothy. Uh, by this time, I guess probably approaching middle age, he's been with Paul for about 17 years, 17 odd years, or it had been 17 odd years since he'd started ministering with Paul. And and, and Paul's there, he's, he's about to be brought before Nero the second time. He knows that Nero's been having the Christians martyred, uh, blaming them for the fires of Rome. And, uh, and so Paul, he's not afraid. He said, I'm now ready to be offered, it's okay, I've finished the course. Oh, I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. He wasn't scared, and uh, and so he's using this opportunity to to write to Timothy, someone that meant a lot to him. He said, First Timothy chapter one, my own son in the faith. Understand if if you if God gives you the blessing of sharing the gospel with someone, and that person sincerely and truly. Uh, you know, has conviction in their heart of their sins and they, and they really trust the Lord Jesus Christ as their saviour by faith to be saved from their sins and from hell forever then that, that person that you share the gospel with becomes your, your son or daughter in Christ spiritually speaking um, and if that person leads somebody else to the Lord Jesus Christ to, to trust him as their saviour that becomes your uh, in reality becomes your spiritual grandchild it's exciting isn't it um you know, uh, if you uh, lead someone that's older than you to the Lord, they've still become a spiritual child in, in, in Christ. It's kind of funny to think about. Maybe some of you have got nephews and nieces that are older than you. Um, and that, that's the situation in my family a little bit. So, And, and it kind of sounds funny, but it's true. And so Paul was writing to Timothy, someone that is, that was special to him. You know, Paul would think back on Timothy, how he came from Lystra or Derby, you know, around the area where he was stoned to death on his first journey. Quite possibly, well, it would seem that, that uh, Timothy was a, a result of the ministry there on Paul's first visit in his first missionary journey. And so here's Paul at the end of his life, and he's thinking back on that time, and he's going, Timothy, my own son of the faith. And he's writing to him. He's saying, Timothy, um, I'm now ready to be offered. Uh, I know this is my time. I, I just, I can feel it in my bones. You know, he's there in, in Memetine prison. He's about to lose his life because of the wickedness of Nero. And, uh, and he's giving Timothy his last charge, so to speak. Have a look at, still there in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Have a look in the previous verses before 6 and 7 that I was just mentioning. Look at verse 1. He said, I charge thee therefore. It's, it's almost like a command. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. And, and we know this is written to a preacher. Paul was writing to Timothy, who was called to the ministry. He said, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. Let me just say this to you, brethren. If God, if God hasn't called you to the ministry, that might be fine, but God's got something for you. And, and I charge you, therefore, before the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead is, that is appearing in his kingdom, to do what God has laid on your heart to do and to be in, the, in life as a Christian. Don't whimper out. Why? Because you'll regret it when you stand before the Lord. If you're saved, praise the Lord. That, that's good. That, that, that will never change, you know, no matter what you do in life. We're all to lead a, a sanctified, righteous life by the working and guiding of the Holy Spirit of God. Not our self-righteousness, but God's leading and guiding. But that doesn't change the fact that God has got something special in His life for you. Uh, sorry, Something special for your life, for your walk in Him. Don't be proud. I charge you, therefore, remember the Lord will judge the quick and the dead. He is going to judge our lives as a Christian. We will stand before the Lord for our works as a Christian to be judged. And we will see from that whether 
at that time individually we'll see whether we've done things in this life as a Christian not to be one that is worthy of a reward we don't live the life as a Christian to get rewards we do not do that we should be doing what we do as a Christian because we love the Lord and we want to please Him because He, he paid it all that's what, it's, that's what next, next weekend is all about Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Not, not me. I couldn't do it for myself. Not even start. None of us can. And so Paul here is, is charging Timothy in, in particular here to do the work of an evangelist because that was what Timothy was called to do. And uh, which by ministering with Paul, by the way, through the years that he was with him, uh, was in reality what he'd already been doing. So, so Paul was just reinforcing here Timothy's call from God so that after he was gone, Timothy would continue, uh, as we can see from the verses that preceded, in, in his calling. He's just giving that bit of extra charge as if, to, as if to say, you know, when I'm gone, Timothy, just keep going in what you're called to do. Don't slack off. I mean, you stop and you think about the time, all of those years of ministry that Paul did. He was the minister to the Gentiles. He went out to the Gentile world. And uh, he preached to many, many, many people. Many churches were started. And so Timothy was with him on the second and third journeys. Uh, he was there in Ephesus. He became, from what we see there in the attribution, we see he became the bishop of, of Ephesus for a while the place of great revival where the word of God went out into all of Asia which is today western Turkey and and so you know when you get the passing of an era which you can honestly say when Paul was martyred that was a passing of an era in the early church uh, it's different when someone's taken from us that's a, a spiritual giant um, I, you know, obviously, I'm not quite old enough to have been around when Charles Spurgeon was here. Uh, not quite. Only like about 100 years of difference, but anyway. Um, you can just imagine when, when, when Charles Spurgeon passed away, the Prince of Preachers, it was the passing of an era in, in, the, in the Christian world. It, was diff it would have been different, as I'm sure it would have been when Paul was passed. You know, when news filled it out to the to the, uh, to the different disciples and apostles that had been alive uh, from the time or had been saved from the time of Christ or just after with, when all the great revivals were happening and so forth. When Paul passed and the news filled it out to those guys, uh, those women, those men, they must have gone, wow, he's gone. After all that he's been through, he's gone. So how much the more for someone like Timothy that was the spiritual child, you know, Paul was the one responsible for his salvation in the sense of preaching the gospel to him. How much more for Timothy? When Paul writes to him and says, Timothy, oh, I'm now ready for you. It's time. You can just, you can feel the emotion of it. He says, Timothy, I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I've kept the faith. And then verse 5 he says, But thou watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. So making full proof of his ministry, it's like Paul saying, don't get, get lax in what God's called you to. Just keep going and, and let God use you to the fullest extent. So to put that in, in, in terms for those that are not called to the ministry, uh, don't get lax in what God has called you to. Don't get lax in what God has called you to be in your life as a Christian. Don't get lax in, in worshipping God in spirit and in truth. Don't get lax in your, in your daily devotion and walk with Him. Don't get lax in being part of the work of God that has given you the opportunity to be there. I charge you therefore. Before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, before whom we will stand, to be judged for our lives as a Christian. 
And no, you can't lose your salvation even if your life stunk as a Christian. Uh, if you don't believe me, read 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15, at the end of the judgment seat of Christ. Some of all of their works are burnt right up, but he shall be saved, yet so as by fire. They'll miss the, the fires of hell, and that's about all. But that's not a position I don't think any one of us want to be. I'm sure none of us want to be in that position. Now, going back to our text verse this morning, with that in mind, that, that, that Paul is really trying to, to take this last opportunity to, to really get, get Timothy ranked up, so to speak, to get him, get him to not forget what God has, God has called him to. Even though, even though Paul, his mentor, uh, would be gone, uh, he's saying, Timothy, keep going. Don't stop. Now, going back to our text verse, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, this is another one. This is another part of this same epistle where Paul is saying to, to Timothy, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. You can understand what Paul is saying there, Thou therefore, my son. Get, the, get what he's saying? It's his spiritual, spiritual offspring, so to speak. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul has put this here, yes, under the inspiration of God. I always say that. It's under the inspiration of God. Paul has put that there before he has said about the ministry. In chapter 4 that we've just been looking at. Why? Because, you know what? That verse doesn't just apply to the ministry, it applies to every born again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to, if you desire in your heart to be all of what God wants you to be, if you desire in your heart to, to, uh, to be used of the Lord to the fullest extent that God has for your life, this is what you need first and foremost. You've got to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And Paul knew that. Paul lived that, and we'll think about that for a little bit this morning. People, the magnitude or the extent of the grace of God that Paul is writing to Timothy about is not restricted to those who are called to the ministry, as Timothy was. Not at all. It is very applicable to all of those who have truly trusted the Lord Jesus Christ is their one and only Saviour from all of their sins and from a literal eternal hell. God doesn't have to give more, oh, sorry, a, a different type of grace to those who are called to the ministry. No, it's just grace. It's just all us, just God's undeserved favour. You know, at times maybe He has to give those in the ministry a little bit extra, but I'm sure. Every born again believer faces times in our lives where we really need a good, a good dose of the grace of God in our lives. His undeserved favour to get through what we're facing. It's for all of us. And it starts with salvation, doesn't it? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. So, in other words, by God's undeserved favour, an individual that truly trusts Christ as Saviour is saved through faith in what the Lord Jesus Christ did at Calvary. Every genuine born-again believer has not just tasted the grace of God, but has drunk of the water of life freely because of the grace of God. And I'm not for one second about to make less of the importance of a spirit-led, sanctified Christian life by the grace of God. Not at all. I'm not going to make less of it. It is a vital part of our walk with the Lord as Christians. And again, not to be a Christian, but as Christians. But if the Lord had not poured out His grace, His undeserved favour upon each and every one who has sincerely placed their faith in Him, in the Lord Jesus Christ, to save their soul for all of eternity, then guess what? You know, we would still be then lost in our own sins and life in the flesh becomes irrelevant. We have drunk of the water of life freely because of God's amazing grace. 
So if you're born again this morning, then what Paul has written to Timothy under the inspiration of God, God is also declaring it to you and myself, every one of us that have partaken of that same grace as Paul and Timothy did. Brethren, let me just say this to you. Don't just recognise God's grace in your life, but be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. There's a big difference. There's a huge difference. And, and I want to try and draw that out this morning for us, to help us. Point number one, what is being strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus? What is it? What's, what, what's it talking about? To be strong in the grace means, for example, having experienced the life-changing, undeserved favour of God at salvation. That brought a spirit-led change of who we are and what we do and what we don't do, not because we're told not to, not because we're, we're, we're frowned on if we do something, but because the Holy Spirit of God laid on our heart as soon as we really truly trusted Christ as our Saviour, that that's not right to do. And it spoke to our hearts and we went, yeah, no, I don't want to do that anymore. Because we could see before God Almighty, don't worry about anybody and any other human person, but we could see before God Almighty that, that it was wrong. And that change came about because of the work of the Holy Spirit of God in us. That change was just by the grace of God. Let me just say this, when the Lord got hold of my heart as a young adult, I was working in the bank, as, as most of you, or pretty much all of you know. At this particular time, I was working for one of the big four in the CBD in Brisbane, up on the 21st floor, in the loans area, in the legal admin section of the bank. And I was just as much of the social scene of that, that, that particular place as anybody else. I'm ashamed to say. But you know what? When the Lord got hold of my heart as a young adult, the life I had lived, I didn't live anymore. I instantly went to work. When I went to work, I instantly was different. And my work colleagues, they, one of them literally said to me, they said, what's happened to you? As if to say, you're, you're weird. No, I, I just had a conscience that God could reach. And it mattered to me what I did in my life because God had shown me his great, amazing grace. That change was instant. Things I used to do, I didn't do them anymore. That change was just by the grace of God. Brethren, if, if you've been no more than saved by the grace of God, and you haven't grown in your life, and I'm not saying anybody here is in that boat, I'm not saying that, but if that be the case, let me just say this to you. Stop and look at how things changed when you trusted Christ as your Lord and Saviour. How you viewed things differently, not because you had to, but because you just knew in your heart. You, you, it had to be. Because the Holy Spirit of God's working there. You know, uh, when the Holy Spirit works in us, it brings strength in the assurance of our salvation. That, that when I went to work after that change in my life, uh, was I, was I nervous? Was I worried about what people were going to say? Yeah, of course I was. I stumbled and I stuttered with what I had to say at that time. But you know, because of the grace of God and the change that it made in my life at that time, it gave me strength. It, it didn't matter to me how much I might have looked like a fool with what I said, because I didn't know how to say it at that time. I just knew that in God that saved my soul, there was strength. That's been strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. 
We tend to be worried about how we look outwardly to people, but don't be worried about that. Just let God be your strength within. It doesn't mean being strong or determined in the flesh, as that is powerless in the things that matter. If you stop and you can probably think of Christians that are that have been strong in the flesh, that think that think that they've been making a stand for God with what they say and the way they act, and it just comes across as arrogant and it causes people to go, Well, if that's what you believe, I don't want to know anything about that. Brethren, you've got to do it in the working and power of the Holy Spirit of God. That's where the strength is. That's where the by God's grace that's where we can be what God wants us to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus so in our hearts we should have that certainty of the Lord's promises towards us that, that gives us that strength that gives us the determination what did uh, what the Lord himself say in John 16 verse 33 he said these things have I written, spoken unto you that in me you might have peace where's that peace? within. In the world you shall have tribulation. Outside, yeah, you're going to have problems. What's the matter with you, Jacko? You're a bit, of a, you're a bit strange today. But be of good cheer. Didn't matter how nervous I was, sitting there going, uh, well, uh, well, you know, it's the God thing, you know? And they're going, oh, you're all right, okay. But be of good cheer. Within the Lord's going, it's okay. It's all right. It, it's good. Don't worry about it. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. When the trials of life come, when temptations come, when our old nature wants to doubt the Lord by His grace, we can be strong. The Lord was not talking of literally overcoming the world physically. Of course not. But he is talking of the victory every born again believer can and should have in our lives as we live for the Lord. Remember, we have the certainty of the promises. We looked at this a while ago about talking about the word hope, how it means uh, that that sure, the sure promises, the certainty of what God has said that it will happen. You know, in this world we get well, it's election time. We're going to get promises flung at us right, left, and centre. We already are. And how many of those are going to be going to be reality? But with God, when he promises something, it will come true right down to the last dot, full stop. They are certain. God's promises are certain. Point number two. Paul lived what he preached. Paul lived what he preached. So Paul was not just shooting from the hip here in 2 Timothy chapter 2. He wasn't just shooting from the hip and making silly statements. You know, uh, Paul could not have continued in serving the Lord unless he had been strong in God's grace that was bestowed uh, upon him. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth uh, that was not availing of that grace that God was bestowing upon them despite where they were at. He wrote in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10 about himself. He said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was, was not in vain. But I laboured more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. What does that mean? Let's break that verse down into three parts. The first part of the verse, Paul stated, uh, he said, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. So, what does that mean? It means that God was called to be the minister to the Gentiles. On the road to Damascus, before Paul, at the point where Paul came to know Christ as his saviour, he was going to Damascus to arrest more Christians, throw them in jail and, and so forth, with the blessing of the high priest. And uh, the light shone on Paul there on the road to Damascus, just as he was approaching the city. And, Lord, and the Lord said to him at that time, he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And Saul, lying there trembling on the road, he knew exactly who he was persecuting. He was persecuting the followers of Jesus. And so here's this voice from heaven saying, Paul, or Saul, Saul, why persecute thou me? He's going, 
who might be persecuting Jesus. And Paul, or Saul at that time, said, Lord, who art thou? Who art thou? And the Lord Jesus said to him, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest, as if to say, it's all you already know. And at that particular point of time, um, Saul believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the first thing he said was, uh, Lord, what will they have me to do? And so uh, the Lord's mission to Paul was to be at the, take the gospel to the Gentiles, to kings, and also to the Jews in those places. And so uh, when Paul said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Oh, yeah, so true. Before he was persecuting the church. But by the grace of God, he got saved. He, he believed on the Lord. And he became a great preacher of the word of God because of God's undeserved favour. If you think about what Paul was before salvation and what he became, uh, it was only because of God's undeserved favour. And that's the same for all of us. And so uh, his grace which was bestowed upon him was not in vain. And then he said, but I uh, laboured more abundantly than they all. That's the second part of the, uh, the second part of the verse. And so what's he, what's he talking about there? Uh, if you have a look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we probably should look at that just to get the right, so you can see the right context. 1 Corinthians 15, when Paul says uh, that God's grace bestowed upon him was not in vain, and he laboured more abundantly than they all. Who's the they all? Well, if you look in the earlier verses, uh, start at verse number uh, 3, it says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, uh, and, he, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, Verse 5, and then he was seen of Cephas, that's Peter, then of the twelve, and after that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me, uh, also as one born out of due time. Then verse 9 he says, I am, for I am the least of the apostles. Uh, because of why? It's what I was saying before, uh, that I'm not meant to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God I am what I am. Uh, and his grace was not, sorry, which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I laboured more abundantly than they all. Talking about all of, the, all of the other disciples, all of the other believers, the apostles that preceded him, that had seen the Lord, and... Uh, and he's saying, God used me more than all of them. And he did. If you think about Paul's missions, you know, he went to many places, many nations like Syria, uh, Asia, which was basically West Turkey in those days, Cilicia and Galatia, which were also in, that, in, that, in, the, in the area which is called Turkey. Went over to Macedonia. He went to Greece, which was Achaia in those days. He went to Cyprus, he went to Crete, he went to Italy, he went to many places in the known world in that, in that day, preaching the message of the gift of God to all who would accept their fact of their lost sinful condition and place their complete faith in Christ and the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then God inspired him to author uh, 14 out of the 27 books of the New Testament. That's half of the books of the New Testament were authored by Paul under the inspiration of God. So that's 51.8% by the way, I worked it out um, just as a thing of interest. He wrote 51.8% of the New Testament, albeit some of them were short epistles, but nonetheless. So yes, it's true, he laboured more abundantly than they all, than Peter and John and James and and Matthias and all of the other apostles and, and the 500 brethren that, that saw the Lord, the resurrected Christ. That was true. But how did he do that? The last part of the verse, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. But the grace of God which was with me. Paul was strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus 
And again, he was stating as a fact, it was only by the grace of God. Don't you know it took a lot of strength from God to be able to do all of what he did to face the, the whippings, uh, the, the, uh, the beatings, the riots, uh, being jailed, shipwrecks. You, you need to be strong in the grace of God to be able to face all of that. So Paul wasn't just spruiking some empty words when he wrote that to Timothy. Uh, the point was this. Paul lived what he preached. Paul lived what he preached. And so you can just imagine Timothy reading Paul's words there in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, knowing that Timothy had been with him for a good number of years of his ministry, and he's going, oh yeah, Paul, yeah, that's exactly what you've been. How many times you, you suffered many, you know, you suffered things. Oh yeah, Paul, you're strong in the grace. As an aside here, let me ask you a question. Has the thought crossed your mind with what we're thinking about right now? How Paul lived what he was saying there in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 about being strong in the grace of Christ. Can you see the importance of your individual testimony? Can you? You need to. Why? People are watching you. People all around you that know you are watching you. They're watching your attitude. They're watching what's important to you. They're watching your speech. They're watching how you conduct yourself, your appearance, your standards. Oh, here we go with a, yeah, thou shalt not. No, no, no. Here we go with a, you need to let the Holy Spirit of God make you what he wants you to be. Your individual testimony is far more important than what you, and I'll include myself and in, in what I realise. Oh, how we need the working of the Holy Spirit of God in our lives. So Paul had indeed made a lasting impression on Timothy. He lived what he preached. Do we in our lives? Do we? We need to. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 7 to 10. Let's have a look over here. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 7 to 10. Now this is the well-known passage where uh, Paul was given a thorn in the flesh. And it's not clear what the thorn in the flesh was in the sense of ultimately how, it, how this affected him. Uh, some say he had like a, a problem with his eyes. Others you know, said he was, you know, he, he walked with, you know, walked with a leaf or something. I think it, you know, there, there's many things that they've said. And nobody knows for sure what the, what the thorn in the flesh ultimately was. And, um, but nonetheless, we can, we can just deal with the facts that Paul has written here. Uh, again, under the inspiration of God, he said, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. He wrote 14 of the, 14 of the, the, uh, the books of the New Testament. Uh, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. In other words, Paul, you're not going to get a big head. And people are not going to worship you more than they worship me. And Paul was okay with that, by the way. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, the Lord obviously, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. What are we seeing there? We're seeing Paul being strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Paul lived what he preached. Do we? We need to. Point number three. Final point this morning, the essential ingredient in being strong in the grace of God. Let's go to Hebrews. 
You probably already know where we're going, and yes, we are. But I want to to draw some things out of this this morning. Hebrews 4, verse 16. Again, an an epistle that's given, whose authorship is, uh, is stated to be Paul. Some will cast doubt on that, but if God had... God had Paul's name attached to it, well, that's good enough for me. Uh, I'm not going to worry about, about Bible critics that have got any more sense than, than a dead fish on the beach at low tide. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Uh, Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Well-known verse, very well-known verse. And uh, the point is, this is the essential ingredient. Have a look at what Paul wrote there. It says, let us come, first of all, let us come boldly. And as hopefully you know by now, that means confidently. Uh, This speaks of one who is strong in the grace of God, as Paul Paul was. Let us therefore come boldly, confidently. In other words, you're in the right place. You're confident in the Lord. You're strong in in His grace, because that is the throne of grace. That's what it says there, literally. Let us come boldly unto the throne of grace, of God's undeserved favour. But look at the verse. At the end of the verse, I should say. It says there that we may, sorry, and find grace to help in time of need. And find grace to help in time of need. Now that word find is quite an interesting word when you dig into it. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't mean, uh, like me, you know, I, I go home and I put the car keys down and then I'll spend the next half an hour looking for them. I put them in a safe place. Anybody seen the car keys? No, Dad's on it again. Do you know what my phone is, Dale? Can you ring my phone so I can find it where I put my phone down? It doesn't mean find in that way. You say, does it really happen in your house? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sorry. But the word find means three things. First, the word find means to discover or uncover. And you might think, how does that apply? Well, perhaps in your walk with the Lord, you've not yet discovered much depth in the grace of God. You may not have discovered how much depth there is in respect of God's undeserved favour towards you individually. The verse says, to find grace to help in time of need. Discover or uncover the grace of God to help in time of need. He wants you to discover more and more how much he desires desires to bestow his grace upon you in life, even down to the small things. Yeah, Steve was talking this morning in Sunday school about how you know, you'll you pray down, you know, the drive down town. Well, can we have a car park down here? And, and it pretty much always happens. You say, do you do that too? Yeah, I do. Sometimes, when I remember. We need to discover how much God wants to bestow his undeserved favour upon us. He, he's interested in the small details of your life. Because whether you realise it or not, the small details do make a big difference in your life. Secondly, the word find also means to perceive. To perceive. That is to understand or recognise the Lord's working when he does something. Now, I've shared a bit of this before, and I'll share it again, but you know, as, as you know, to, to use this as an illustration, as you know, we, we lived over in Avoca for 10 years from when we got here. Same house. Uh, one day, the real estate agent walked up at the door, beginning of COVID, and said, you've got eight weeks to move. And, uh, and the owners wanted the house back. So we set about, we're going to rent, we're going to buy. I really didn't want to rent. By the grace of God, the Lord gave us a little house over there along the, along the highway. I'm so thankful for it. But, you know, when I went to go to the bank to see what, if I could get a loan 
to buy it. As I drove down the main street, of course going back to the bank I used to work for, drove down the main street, getting nervous, thinking, Lord, I'm 59 years old at that time. 59 years old, um, coming up in six, seven months to my birthday, 60th birthday, and we're going to get another, we're going to get a gun to debt for a, for a house. And so I thought, I'll just pray. I'll pull over, I'll pray before I go into the bank. Lord, is this really what you want me to do? Or us to do, I should say. And as I pulled into that bay, I could, and, and I started to pray, I only got about a sentence or so out of my, uh, you know, out of the line to the Lord. And then I, then it was, just, I was distracted by music. It was violin music. And so, what's that? And it stopped me from praying. I opened the door, and it was someone playing on the violin, Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace. You know, in that undercover area in the center, in the center of the city. And the part of the hymn that was playing at that time was, through many dangers, toils and snares, I have already come. And grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. You know, uh, so the Lord's saying, it's okay, Graham, off you go. Just off you go to the bank and it's okay. I perceived the Lord's leading in that area. Make sense? I could perceive that God was working. I could, I could perceive, I could understand or recognise the Lord's working when he does something in that case. Brethren, the Lord doesn't just want you to discover or, or uncover how deep His grace will be in your life or can be in your life. He wants you to perceive when He does something also. And thirdly, the word find means to obtain. To obtain. God can work in your life and my life. He can be leading us and guiding us. But let me just say this to you. Despite how great is God's undeserved favour towards us, we've got an enemy. Well, we've got two, actually. One is the devil. Oh, yeah, I don't really believe it. Yeah, well, that's, that's your problem if you don't. He'll lead you down the garden path. But the immediate threat is within you. It's your old nature. It's your flesh. And, that, and, and they, they are such a hindrance to obtaining what God wants in, in, in your life, in my life. Isn't it true that we know that the answer to a victorious Christian life is found through a healthy relationship with our Lord? And how do we build our relationship with Him? Through being frequently at the throne of grace and, and in His Word. And you know what? We know it in our hearts that that's true. We do. But isn't it also true that we are not obtaining grace to help in time of need in the manner we could be? God wants us to go deeper. He wants us to uncover how deep that goes. He wants us to have more, be able to perceive His leading and working more and more in our lives. He wants us to obtain all that He wants to give us. He wants to bestow upon us that we don't deserve. That's grace. He wants us to, 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 to obtain, sorry, to uncover, to perceive, and to obtain the grace of God in the manner which Paul did. Not, not going through all of what Paul went through. We're not going to go through all of that. But to the extent that Paul did. Paul knew the grace of God intimately in his life. And so Paul could honestly write to, uh, to Timothy, and Timothy knew, oh, with all his heart, that what Paul was saying was true. He said, in Paul's last charge to Timothy, the second epistle, he said, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And brethren, I say the same thing to you today. 
be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. It'll make the world of difference to your walk with Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for being able to, at this time, Lord, just be here and open your word and dig into its riches. And we thank you for the riches of your word this morning. Lord, I know that it's a challenge to me in my life. Lord, may we never get to the point where we think we've made it in, the walk, in our walk with you because we never will. Not this side of eternity. And Lord, I, I do pray, Father, that pray that, that Lord, you, we would learn from these things this morning that we would desire a deeper and richer walk with you that we may be as Paul admonished Timothy to be, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Dear God, I just pray for the working and guiding of the Holy Spirit of God at this time. And Lord, I thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to uh, close with hymn number 244. 244. Amazing grace. Amazing grace. As we approach the time of year where we remember Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, what what a what a, uh, a fitting thing to think of! Amazing grace. In 244, and there's uh, there's a music playing softly there for 244, singing and him talking of the the wretch that was saved by the grace of God, John Wesley, or John Newton, I should say, sorry. Let's have all heads bowed and all eyes closed. All heads bowed and all eyes closed. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed. Are you strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus? Is Jesus your Lord and Saviour? For sure and certain. If he is, do the winds of life batter you? Do they toss you around? Or is the grace of God, like it was in Paul's life, strong? Working in your life. Can you honestly look at your life and say, yea Lord, I do trust you when those times in life come. By your grace, you give me strength. Is that you this morning? I'd like you to stop and think and reflect on this this morning. Are you strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus? Let's pray. still praying, please continue to do so. Please, please, please do continue to keep praying. If you're finished, let's be upstanding and sing number 244. And we'll sing the first, second and fourth verses.
towards us. Lord, I just do pray as we go from here this morning that the Holy Spirit of God would work uh, in our hearts individually. Lord, help us to not just know that you are there, but Lord, to want to dig deeper and deeper into our relationship with you, to know you more and more. And Father, I just do I commit these things to you. I thank you and praise you. And Lord, I ask and pray these things in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord bless you. Good morning.